Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this um, the third and I must say, unfortunately, final uh, lecture of Professor Susan Wolf, Lex Pufendorf lecture. She has been uh, talking about quite intriguing things up to now, but I must say this title is really intriguing. So I'm looking very much forward to hear what Susan has to say about selves like us. Please. <coughs> Well, thank you once more for coming to the lecture, uh, for some of you to the second, and for others even for the third of my lectures this week. Quite a uh, remarkable show of dedication, and I appreciate it. Um, and let me uh, thank the department for uh, the warm hospitality that I have received throughout the visit. It's been, it's been terrific. Uh, In my first Pufendorf lecture, I suggested that reflecting on the range of judgments and attitudes we form towards artists on the basis of their artworks encourages us to draw two vague but suggestive conclusions. First, I claimed, it supports the idea that the concept of responsibility is not as unified or as clean as much theorizing about the concept appears to assume. Second, I said, it brings to light the fact that what makes us distinctively human is conceived too narrowly if it is identified with the properties of practical rationality and self-control. My initial thought when I started writing that lecture was that the inadequacy of concepts of responsibility and humanity to which I was objecting were a consequence of a preoccupation with our specifically moral agency turning to a non-moral dom domain like aesthetics, thus helped us enlarge our vision and develop richer versions of these concepts. But my second lecture reached much the same conclusion, at least about the concept of responsibility, even though its main examples involved straightforwardly moral values and behavior. So perhaps it is not just a preoccupation with morality, but with a specific conception of morality that has led us to think about responsibility and humanity in the ways I want to broaden and complicate. I shall have a little more to say about that at the end of today's lecture, but my main focus today will be on the second theme that runs through the previous lectures, that is, on the idea that what makes us distinctively human is conceived too narrowly if it's identified with the properties of practical rationality and self-control. Today, I want to expand on this idea, clarifying it and giving it more substance. But as you will see, my reflections will raise more questions than they answer. My aim here is only to point out some directions in which the pursuit of an answer to the question of what makes us distinctively human might usefully proceed. Before exploring the topic, though, I need to say more about what I take that question to mean and why it might be worthwhile to ask it. The question has been around since philosophy began, as one would expect of a discipline that could fairly be characterized as aiming at understanding ourselves and our relation to the world. Indeed, the question is equivalent to the question, what is it to be among the selves that we untheoretically embrace when we say that philosophy is aimed at understanding ourselves? What is it, in other words, to be a self like us? to be, that is, one of the ourselves that philosophy aims to understand. As I mean to use it, the question is misunderstood if it is taken to be, that is, reduced to a question of biology. When philosophers and other humanists ask about the distinctively human, they tend to be interested in an ethical as opposed to a biological notion. They are interested in a concept that has fundamental practical significance, that identifies individuals that we can relate to in certain especially rich and rewarding ways, beings with whom we can be in community. And we know that this is not a purely biological notion because we can imagine individuals who are not members of our species who satisfy these conditions. Winnie the Pooh, Peter Rabbit, Star Trek's Mr. Spock, are all, to some extent, cells like us, though not of our species. 
And although membership in our species may link anyone to us in some ways, the very young, the severely brain damaged, and the seriously mentally ill are hardly paradigms of the selves like us category that we are trying to grasp. In an attempt to pursue our question without courting confusion, some philosophers have used the term person to refer to what I am calling a self like us, specifically distinguishing the concept of a person from the biological notion of a human being. Thus, Locke, after introducing a thought experiment in which the psychology of a prince comes to inhabit the body of a cobbler, suggests that although it would be a travesty of language to say of the transformed cobbler that he was the same man as the former prince, the important relation between the one and the other can be captured by referring to them as stages of the same person. A person, according to Locke, is a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself the same thinking thing in different times and places. Peter Singer makes a similar distinction using person to refer to a rational and self-conscious being. By keeping in mind the fact that persons in this sense need not be members of our species and that members of our species need not be persons, Singer believes that we can think more clearly about whether, and if so, why, some individuals should be treated differently from others. But if some philosophers avoid the term human to refer to the non-biological notion, <coughs> others continue to use it. Kant's principle of humanity is clearly meant to apply not to homo sapiens, but to those Singer would call persons. And in Freedom of the Will and the Concept of a Person, Harry Frankfurt uses the terms human and person interchangeably in accordance with stylistic grace. <coughs> to my ears, the term person, when used philosophically in a way that is self-consciously not equivalent to human being, refers especially to rational agents in keeping with Locke and Singer. In addition to the imaginary <coughs> talking animals and extraterrestrials, it can, and sometimes does, refer to corporations and states. When people invoke the idea of the distinctively human, on the other hand, they often have different, somewhat different they, uh, traits from rational agency in mind. And it would be most unusual for someone to think of Walmart or the European Union as a self like us. Since my purpose is in any case to consider ways in which the identification of the ethical notion of humanity with rational agency falls short, I shall continue to use humanity in this non-biological way. I shall leave open for the moment how it relates to the term person as it's been used in philosophy. The concept of the distinctively human then is a non-biological notion equivalent to the notion of a self like us which I said is an ethical category meant to be a fundamental practical significance. But what practical significance? I said that the concept identifies individuals that we can relate to in certain especially rich and rewarding ways, beings with whom we can be in community. But the notion of community is as imprecise and ambiguous as the term we are trying to pin down. Without a clearer statement of the purposes for which the concept is to be used, or of the particular practical and ethical questions it is to have a role in answering, the concept may seem so vague and elusive as to be questionably a concept at all. At best, one might think that the notion is too slippery to be a proper object of philosophical analysis. The problem may be even more obvious if we consider the term selves like us which I want to use interchangeably with the distinctively human. For who is the we, the us, this question hopes to characterize in an illuminating way. If we can answer this question from the start, it's doubtful that there's need of a philosophical investigation at all. But if we cannot answer the question, what exactly are we asking? Along with these conceptual questions, and perhaps even more pressing, there are moral concerns about this project. For one might reasonably worry that the exploration of the category of the distinctively human 
will serve as a pretext for treating one set of creatures as more important, worthy of respect and benefit than another. Identifying, identifying this category with the category of selves like us makes explicit the fact that we are talking about a distinction between an us and a them. The worry is that such a distinction will inevitably support attitudes and practices that are unjustifiably discriminatory, if not positively oppressive. Both these concerns are legitimate, and my responses are unlikely to be fully satisfactory. But the conceptual problem of trying to understand and illuminate a concept that we cannot clearly delineate at the beginning of the inquiry is a common one in philosophy, and we can address it by means of the same methods we employ in our investigations of other questions. We begin with a term or a phrase that is used in common discourse, usually without any conscious awareness that one is not exactly sure what one means by it. We try to articulate the meaning of the term, Perhaps we propose an analysis of it. And then we move back and forth among intuitions, linguistic data, and theoretical thought, aiming to reach a reflective equilibrium between the proposal's ability to capture most of the term's pre-theoretical applications and its ability to illuminate or justify its use in paradigmatic cases. Further, and despite the fact that the inquiry is expressed as the search for an illumination of an apparently single and unified concept, we need not assume that the result of the inquiry will support this initial presumption. The concept may turn out to be a family resemblance concept without clear boundaries and concerning which different criteria may be salient in different contexts. Or reflection may encourage us, encourage us to associate the term with two or more distinct concepts, each roughly unified and closely enough related to the other as to allow the distinction to have gone unnoticed until subjected to philosophical scrutiny. The view that I discussed in my previous lectures that the concept of responsibility breaks into two branches may be an example of such an inquiry. And by the end of today's lecture, one may come to wonder whether a similar and related pair of branches may capture importantly different clusters of aspects of the distinctively human. What about the moral concern that any inquiry that takes seriously the idea of the distinctively human and that consequently looks to identify features that separate the indeterminate us from the anonymous them is liable to support morally objectionable practices and attitudes? Unquestionably, there is a historical basis for this concern appeals to the human have played a role in permitting ill treatment of other species, whether the term is used biologically or ethically, while in addition, in the non-biological case, it's been called into service in the justification of treating some people as inferior to others. Blacks and women, as well as the mentally impaired, have often been considered rationally defective and consequently less than fully human despite their membership in the same species. Insofar as one takes the distinctively human to be a term with positive connotations then, identifying something as distinctively human carries with it the danger that creatures who lack it will be unduly neglected, mistreated, or oppressed. But it seems to me that there is equal danger in avoiding the term and any, con and any consequent inquiry into what it means. For the term and a variety of equivalent expresses are invoked in public as well as academic discourse more often than one might initially suppose, and the concept informs the way we think of ourselves in unconscious subliminal ways. Since my own interest in the topic aims at combating what seems to me an overly narrow and limited understanding of the term, we may hope that the inquiry into the concept will result in a more rather than a less inclusive attitude this time around. Furthermore, we need not, and I believe we should not, identify the fact that a feature contributes to what makes us distinctively human with the thought that the feature is one that it is objectively valuable to have. We need not think that people or humans are superior to other creatures or things more worthy of existence or concern from the point of view of the universe. 
Indeed, we need not think that selves like us are more worthy of existence and concern than other creatures, even from our own point of view. This is not incompatible, however, with using the term in a way that attaches positive connotations to the distinctively human. For the features that make us distinctively human contribute to our ability to relate to each other in distinctively rich and rewarding ways. Presumably, this is a good thing for us, even if it is a matter of indifference to the universe. And we may prize these features of ourselves, as well as of the relationships they make possible, without thinking that others who lack them are inferior. After all, we may prize our cultures without thinking that other cultures, or the people whose cultures they are, are worse. Philosophers may prize their love of philosophy without thinking that those who have no interest in philosophy are mistaken or stupid. While these analogies show the conceptual separability of prizing some, straight, some trait in ourselves with judging it to be objectively better, they also serve as a precaution. For we're all too familiar with atrocities performed in the name of something like cultural superiority. And there are still many philosophers who agree with Socrates that the unexamined life is not worth living. Against the tendencies of narrower identities to serve as pretexts for indifference and disdain for those outside one's group, an interest in the distinctively human can have a softening influence, giving us a basis for making connection to others across the divisions that these other classifications set up. At the same time, the tendency to regard what we value in ourselves as things that make us uniquely valuable or special is a real one. One can only hope that to be forewarned is to be forearmed. So, let us proceed. What does contribute to what makes us distinctively human? what is involved in being a self like us. We may begin by noting and acknowledging the truth in what others have said. As I've mentioned, the do dominant tradition in Western thought has emphasized our intelligence, and more particularly, our capacity to reason. Given that the most obvious contrast class to the human is other animals, this is not surprising. For we are smarter, I would say much smarter, than at least most other animals. We are not only conscious, we are self-conscious. We are aware of ourselves as individuals in a world with other individuals. And we are rational, and thus able to solve problems and to compare and weigh alternative actions to determine which option will best meet our goals. These features already serve to distinguish us dramatically from most animals, whose reactions to stimuli, at least so I imagine, are to a large extent hardwired and inflexible. They see a fast-moving dark object and flick their tongues to grab it. They hear a certain noise and go rigid, playing dead. A certain display leads to mating behavior, another to aggression. Animals whose behavior is fully governed in this way may have no thoughts up beyond their perceptions. They make no choices, they just react. But even animals that can solve problems, use tools, and so on, are much less intellectually proficient than we are. As many have emphasized, our ability to use language is both reflective of and instrumental to a wealth of further intellectual abilities that divide us from other species. Being able to think abstractly and conceptualize possibilities allows us to engage in theoretical reasoning, to stand back imaginatively from how things are and conceive of how they might be. <coughs> if contrasting ourselves with other animals makes our higher, intelligence, our higher intelligence salient, however, consideration of other, perhaps imaginary beings who share or even surpass our cognitive and conceptual abilities makes us mindful of other features that may just as strongly distinguish selves like us from others. The kinds of beings I have in mind include gods or God, extraterrestrials, and artificially intelligent machines. 
Fantasy and science fiction movies and books are full of such creatures. Evidently, we are fascinated by them. Some of the things that differentiate, differentiate us from such figures we may regard as weaknesses. We are sentient, opening us to the experience of pain as well as pleasure. We have appetites, which can lead us astray, causing us to act against our own interests as well as against the interests of others. We are mortal, fragile, fallible, and vulnerable. We are also emotional creatures. Especially significant are our capacities for love and compassion. It's the absence of such dispositions that makes some portrayals of intelligent non-humans literally alien and terrifying. And when we see capacities for love or sympathy, or for dispositions resembling love and sympathy, in less intelligent species, it makes, uh, makes us regard them as closer to being cells like us, closer perhaps than the cold but super rational creatures of our imagination. In one especially moving account from the 19th century, a member of a shooting party recounts a scene that followed his group's killing a female monkey, an event which provoked a great fuss from the monkey group. At length, the author writes, the leader of the monkeys came to the door of the tent and finding threats of no avail, began a lamentable moaning and by the most expressive gesture seemed to beg for the dead body. It was given to him, he took it sorrowfully in his arms and bore it away to his expecting companions. They who were witnesses to this extraordinary scene, he continues, resolved never again to fire at one of the monkey race. Such scenes as this, we are told, repeatedly persuaded the people involved in the humanity of the monkeys, leading them to remove monkeys from the category of quarry. Such cases are perhaps enough to conclude that cells like us must be both intelligent and emotional. Both aspects together may be necessary to account for a further distinctive feature of us that philosophers like Harry Frankfurt Gary Watson and Christine Korsgaard have emphasized in recent years. Frankfurt famously noted that it is a distinctive feature of persons that they can stand back from their first order desires and motives and ask whether they are desires and motives that they want to have and to act on. In other words, we have the ability to ask what sorts of people we want to be and what sorts of lives we want to live. We can identify some aspects of ourselves. We can identify with some aspects of ourselves and disclaim others. We can form ideals and aspire to them. Linked to this is the availability of a distinction between values and desires, between things we simply want and things we care about, where caring is not simply a matter of wanting a great deal. It's hard to imagine such distinctions and that it's hard to imagine that such dis distinctions and attitudes are available to any non-human animals, even relatively smart animals <coughs> such as elephants and monkeys. And I attribute this to the limitations of their cognitive and conceptual capacities. But I cannot imagine gods or intelligent machines being prone to such distinctions and attitudes either. For without passions or emotions, what could lead to a discrepancy between desire and care? Concerning more specific attributes and activities that we especially cherish in, our, cherish in ourselves and that non-humans don't seem to be capable of possessing allows us to approach the question of what it is to be a self like us in a different way. In my first lecture, I pointed to our ability to make art for which we could be aesthetically responsible as well as our abilities to appreciate art and beauty as reflective of a soul or a self like us. We might also consider our capacity for humor, or indeed, for philosophy. One does not imagine or expect lower animals to have senses of humor or to be prone to philosophical speculation because we think or assume that animals lack the cognitive capacities for such things. But the fact that we do not typically imagine futuristic robots to exhibit these traits, nor know how one could program them to have or develop such features, may be even more revealing. We've been able to, com 
program computers to play chess and even go, but can we set them to solve the problem of free will? Perhaps even more interesting is the question of whether we can program computers that would come to wonder about the problem of free will on their own. What is it about these sensitivities and dispositions that make the idea of finding them in or building them into artificial intelligences so unlikely and surprising? Part of the answer may have to do with the fact that we often picture AI individuals as being without sentience or emotion, for it is not clear whether beauty or humor could make sense to a purely cerebral being. Another part, I suspect, has to do with the fact that when we build computers or artificially intelligent machines, we do so with specific functions in mind. We pro program them to solve problems, perform tasks. The reasoning we put into them is instrumental. And though I know that advanced machines are increasingly flexible, they teach themselves, change their own programs, and are thus in some sense creative, it's my impression that these added abilities are still defined and shaped by their tendencies to aid in the achievement of more general, predefined goals. Looking for and finding beauty and humor in the world, and asking and answering philosophical questions, however, are in a sense gratuitous. They can only serve a purpose for cells like us, who find such things gratifying for their own sakes. The sensitivities to beauty, to humor, to philosophy, and the abilities to create things that will reward such sensitivities, thus seem to highlight propensities of cells like us beyond the features that I mentioned earlier. A being that can cultivate an interest in philosophy must be able to approach the world with a kind of non-instrumental curiosity, if not a sense of wonder. To see beauty in the world, or humor, one must have an eye or an ear for the interesting, the quirky, and so on. More basically, one must be the sort of being for which something's being more or less interesting, quirky, and so on makes sense. Thus, I am inclined to suggest that in order to be a self like us, one must have the capacity to be interested in things for their own sakes, and perhaps connected to this, a capacity to be curious and to ask and pursue answers to open-ended questions. For example, questions about the meaning of life, or about how to live, or about the interpretation of Hamlet. The fact that I cannot imagine how to program a computer to have these capacities does not mean that it can't or won't someday be done. My point is rather that if it were done, it would bring machines significantly closer to candidacy for inclusion in the group cells like us. But perhaps in the interest of looking at the ways in which smart machines still lack features essential to being cells like us, I was too quick to dismiss the bonds we do and can have with lower animals. Elephants paint, after all, birds sing, bunnies play, and cats are said to be curious. Is it possible that they do or can have the sorts of traits that we cherish in each other? It's instructive to think for a moment about what a sensitivity to beauty or humor for an animal, or for that matter, for a very young child, can be. Of course, I don't really know. I'm not an ethologist, and even if I were, it would not be obvious or uncontroversial what it would take for an animal's behavior to constitute evidence of an aesthetic sensibility or of wit. But I do want to insist that an attraction to some visual shapes and forms as opposed to others, to red curvy things, for example, or even to pictures of kittens, does not a sensitivity to beauty make. Nor does a bird that responds predictably to a particular three-note pattern have what I am inclined to consider a degree of musical appreciation. To be sure, one has to start somewhere in the development of aesthetic sensibility, both in the evolution of our species and in the cultivation of our individual capacities. And it may well be that such attractions and their opposites form the foundation of our acquisi acquisition of aesthetic taste. An attraction to sweet things may be the beginning of the development of a culinary sensibility. 
the six-year-old boy who is sent into peals of laughter by every use of the word toilet or breast, may be at an incipient stage of developing a sense of humor. But as interesting as it is to notice a continuum between such simple attractions, repulsions, and sensitivities, and the possession of a mature wit or aesthetic taste, it's also important to recognize how great the distance is between the primitive capacities at issue and their mature realization in normal human adults. For it is the developed forms and the potential for development that we cherish in ourselves and each other. It is the developed forms that contribute to an individual's distinctive identity that can provide a basis for admiration, respect, and relationship. To be capable of a developed form of humor a philosophical turn of mind, an aesthetic taste, among other things, it appears that one needs a combination of intellectual faculties and some other dispositions, difficult to identify or pin down on their own, that motivate and open one up to certain, sort, to certain sorts of discriminations and values. Lower animals appear to lack the intellectual faculties to the requisite degree, but the powers of reason that might make, say, an artificially intelligent individual capable of solving all sorts of predefined problems may also be insufficient to ensure that it is capable of developing in these recognizably human ways. Moreover, the kinds of intellectual capacities needed to combine with primitive capacities for interest, amusement, and pleasure, for the development of humor, taste, and so on, are not well captured if we identify intelligence or intellectual capacity with reason or rationality. I'm not sure what faculties are involved in the acquisition of a developed sense of humor or aesthetic taste, but I would not be surprised if these faculties were not picked up by our standard intelligence tests or by the examinations that qualify one for admission to university. So far, I've looked at attributes and activities that might be thought to be particularly demanding of our intellects. And this may give rise to a concern that my picture of the distinctively human looks suspiciously like that of an academic philosopher. By cells like us, a critic might suggest, I seem to have in mind cells like me, <laughs> that is, like Susan Wolfe, nerdy, bourgeois, 60-something American female. I acknowledge a danger of that, as it seems to me, there's always a danger in philosophizing about the human condition that one will overgeneralize from one's own case or from the cases of those in one's close surrounding social world, projecting their faculties, interests, and values onto the species as a whole. The only way to protect against that or correct it that I know of is to ask for help from others. For example, from you. If my claims about what we what we cherish strike you as idiosyncratic or narrow, please say so. If my views are elitist or provincial, show me how. First, however, let me make a few remarks preemptively in my defense. First, we should be careful not to over-intellectualize what counts as a developed and mature form of humor or of aesthetic taste or of philosophy. Though some humor is highly cerebral, much is not. The physical comedy of, say, Buster Keaton or Steve Martin is as different from a rat's disposition to laugh in pleasure when tickled as that of Oscar Wilde and George Bernard Shaw. And the kind of impulse to create and appreciate aesthetic experience should not be interpreted in a way that confines this to engagement with the high or fine arts. The aesthetic impulse shows itself in craft, in fashion, even in the tattoo parlor, as it does in kitchens all over the world, and the music that is passed down from gener generation to generation in the hollers of Appalachia is as far from birdsong as the compositions performed by the Berlin Philharmonic. Nor are the quests for meaning and self-understanding that are the basis of the urge to philosophize restricted to the educated upper classes. Arguably, the religion and mythologies of ancient and indigenous cultures are symptoms of it. And if not, they are surely symptoms of something distinctively human 
that I have not yet named. But second, it's also instructive to consider activities that we are not even tempted to think of as particularly intellectual, for example, athletics. For although we do admire animals for their physical elegance and skills, the grace and swiftness of a gazelle or a cheetah, for example, the acrobatics of a squirrel leaping from windowsill to bird feeder, or the mouth-eye coordination of a frisbee-catching golden retriever, the kind of admiration we have for human athletes seems to me of a qualitatively different kind. In the case of team sports or competitive games, this is at least partly because of the complexity of the performances in question. To play basketball or tennis, one must take in kinds of information, make kinds of decision, exercise kinds of judgment that other animals are incapable of. Moreover, such skills have to be learned, not only because they involve conventional rules, but also because it requires training and ingenuity to be able to develop oneself beyond a certain point. Connected to this, perhaps, is another feature of distinctively human endeavors that we have not yet emphasized, namely the capacity to struggle against one's natural tendencies, to push oneself beyond one's natural limits. Though animals can be persistent, they cannot choose to be. They cannot display determination. They cannot possess strength or, for that matter, weakness of will. When we compare an Olympic swimmer to a fish or a world-class mountain climber to a yak, both the expertise and the determination required for their activities are different, making the activities achievements for the human athletes in a way they cannot be for the animals. When human beings paint when human beings paint or sing, climb mountains or take walks then, they are doing something significantly different from an elephant or a warbler, a mountain goat or a bear, whose behavior we might use the same phrases to describe. In each case, the human's greater cognitive powers, their intelligence, invests the activity with a meaning it cannot have in the case of their animal counterparts, making it plausible for others to see in the human's activities reflections or expressions of selves like us. But these cognitive powers are not easily grasped or described in ways that we can imagine programming into machines. Journals and books and YouTube videos are full of stories that bring out and celebrate the often surprising abilities of non-human animals and machines. They tell us how smart some of these animals are and how much new computers can do. But in some contexts, it's important also that we consider what they cannot do, or at any rate, how different they are from us. Importantly, the differences in what these other sorts of individuals do and can do seem to be reflections of differences in what they are and can be. In particular, I'm inclined to say, they are not and cannot be selves. What I mean by that is that their psychologies, in the case of those that have psychologies, are not rich enough to give them individual variegated points of view of the kind we respond to as one subject to another. Thinking about the difference between what goes on when a human being paints a picture or composes a song from what goes on when an elephant or a machine does these things, it seems reasonable to think that in the former case, but not the latter, the individual is expressing something. There is, as I want to put it, a self behind the painting or the song that is reflected in what the creator creates. And this rightly affects the way we see or hear the art as well as the way we relate to the artist. This is true, or at least so I argued in my first lecture, even if one is primarily or even exclusively interested at the conscious level in the art alone and not in its creator. It seems to me that the same can be said of our in attitudes towards and interest in sports. Sports fans might well think of themselves as not having any interest in the psychologies of the players. They do not typically care about the athletes' lives, their thoughts, their politics, 
They just want to see a good game. But the interest we would have in watching a game played by two teams of basketball playing robots or a, or a competition between two robotic golfers would be very different from the interest we have in the human games. And this brings out that what we typically care about in sports is also deeply connected to the fact that the athletes who are engaging in them ourselves like us, realizing their potentials in ways that reflect their individual efforts and styles. What is it then to be or to have a self? I regret that I don't have any satisfying answer. My repeated suggestions to imaginatively contrast human activities with animal <coughs> and robotic ones are offered as substitutes, at least for the time being, for an adequate characterization. I've said that to have a self involves having a rich and variegated point of view, but what I, what I mean by a rich and variegated point of view still remains elusive. By rich and variegated, I do not simply mean fine-grained or complex. By a point of view, I do not simply mean a spatio-temporal location from which a sensing individual perceives the world. In these senses, an animal or an artificially intelligent machine clearly can have a rich and variegated point of view. Rather, I mean something like a take on the world that involves evalu evaluative assessments as well as physical discriminations, that sees objects, activities, goals, and so on as more or less worthwhile, interesting, or good. Moreover, it is part of the idea of a self that such evaluative discriminations are not blind or arbitrary but are rather results of an active intelligence that synth synthesizes thoughts, experiences, perceptions, and desires, continually updating the self's point of view so that it is in principle always subject to change. Strictly speaking, it seems possible for an individual to be or to possess a self without being or possessing a self like us. For to be a self, as I'm using the term, is to have a psychology that is rich enough to have what I am gesturing at when I talk about a variegated and evaluative take on the world. And it is in principle possible that an individual could have such a take, but one that is unintelligible to us because its perceptual mechanisms, its needs and wants, and its emotional repertoire are so different from ours. Since my primary interest is in the idea of the distinctively human, however, I shall leave aside further speculation about selves who are not like us, at least for today. I'm inclined to say that selves and only selves can have characters, as opposed to mere collections of behavioral and psychological dispositions. That only selves can understand and appreciate things, as opposed to merely being in possession of facts, and that consequently, only selves can have virtues and vices. Though I don't know how to prove such things, I hope they will be plausible. Let me just see, am I in the right? Sorry. Uh, I hope they'll be plausible when one thinks about, one thinks not only about how a chess playing computer or a robotic basketball player differs from a human one, and how an elephant painter or a singing bird differs from a human artist, but also when one compares what it means when people say that lions are courageous, that lambs are gentle, and that crocodiles are mean, with what we mean when we attribute these qualities to individual people. As I've said before, it doesn't really matter for my purposes whether the generalizations I've been making about animals and robots are liter literally true. It doesn't matter, that is, whether it's literally true that no animal or machine can be courageous in the way a human can be courageous, that no animal or machine can make a painting that could mean what a human can mean when she paints. For my point is not to insist that selves like us are restricted to members of our own species. My point is rather to call attention to what it is to have the qualities that we value in ourselves so that we do not settle for overly crude descriptions of these things and thereby misunderstand or neglect the things that we value. The reason for comparing a lion's courage to human courage is to understand what we mean by courage. 
The reason for comparing a chorus of birds <coughs> to an a cappella group is to understand what we mean by music. And more generally, the reason to compare humans to lower animals, machines, and other conceivable rational beings is to understand what it is to be a self like us. That is, to be enough of a self and enough like us to be a candidate for membership in a certain particularly re rewarding kind of community. For participation with others, in P.F. Strassen's words, in interpersonal human relationships. Aside from the intrinsic interest of such a project, which I hope is considerable, engaging in it may help us avoid certain errors. Against the background in particular of a history in which the association of humanity with rationality has been overemphasized, attention to the ways in which rationality falls short and to the ways in which other features contribute to being a self like us may serve as a useful corrective. One place where the inquiry may have practical relevance is in the area of education, where the growing tendency first to see education in purely instrumental terms, and second, to strongly favor training in the STEM disciplines over support for the arts and humanities, may be linked to the unreflective association between our humanity, or our personhood, and our reason. Attention to this issue should also make a difference, I think, to many, to many issues in philosophy and the social sciences. For the overemphasis on reason and rationality and the corresponding under, underemphasis on other features of human psychology have shaped not only our conception of what is distinctively human, but our analyses of many of the other features with which our humanity is associated. Our analyses, for example, of intelligence, of creativity, of value, of character, and of responsibility. To illustrate this last point, let me conclude by returning to the topic of responsibility to draw some connection between today's speculations and the discussion of that topic in my first two lectures. As I noted in my last lecture, it's common in philosophy to think of responsible agency as a more or less unified property distinguishing some individuals from others. To be a responsible agent, it's tempting to say, is to be an individual whose relation to his actions and omissions is such as to make him an appropriate object of praise and blame, reward and punishment, gratitude and resentment. Responsible agency is frequently regarded as a mark of personhood or of the distinctively human, and although there is no consensus on sufficient conditions of responsible agency, there is general agreement that the powers of rational deliberation and self-control are at any rate necessary conditions. In my first lecture, however, I argued that reflecting on the relation between artists and their art, and on art appreciators' relation to both, gave us reason to question both the clarity and the unity of the concept of responsibility. For it seemed to me that there was a sense in which one might regard an artist as aesthetically responsible for her art, even if, due perhaps to mental illness or some other psychological impairment, she were not rational and self-controlled enough to be held responsible for following social norms. A person's art might move us or speak to us as a communication from one subject or self to another, even if the artist were not fully responsible in a sense that made it appropriate to hold her accountable for her behavior. At the same time, I suggested, it's possible even easy to imagine an individual who is fully accountable for her behavior, but is totally without the ability not only to create art, but to respond to art. A fully morally accountable agent might entirely lack a sensitivity to art and beauty. In the context of today's lecture, we might say that a sensitivity to beauty is just one example among many of the features that we humans possess and cherish that the powers of rational, deliberative agency and self-control neither require nor assure. The capacities for empathy, for humor, for philosophy, the ability to develop an evaluative take on the world that is continually updated through the acquisition and integration of new experiences and thoughts 
are all aspects that contribute to individuals being selves like us, potential participants in the kinds of interpersonal relationships and communities that are among the most rewarding and meaningful aspects of our lives. If being a responsible agent is supposed to put one in this class, then responsible agency requires something more or other than the powers of rational deliberation and self-control. But those powers of rational deliberation and control are distinctively important, and there are some contexts where they are overwhelmingly more important than any of these other possible features of individuals. It is those powers in particular that give us the ability to negotiate with each other, that allow us to formulate norms and follow them, that make it possible for us to establish complex systems of enforcement, expectation, and trust. In short, that allow us to cooperate with each other in ways on which civilization, and according to some theories, morality depends. Indeed, Samuel Puffendorf was instrumental in showing us the importance of thinking of morality, or at least a part of morality, in this way. And so it seems to me there is a reason to hold on to the concept that distinguishes individuals who have th these powers from those who do not. Who fits into this category? Normal adult human beings, at least, but perhaps other rational beings as well, including possible aliens and certain, so and certain sorts of abnormal adult human beings, such as sociopaths and perhaps also organizations, such as corporations and states. This category, consisting of individuals who, according to the vocabulary I used in my earlier lectures, is the category of individuals who can reasonably be held accountable for things, is at least roughly the same as the class that Peter Singer and others would identify as persons. The point of these lectures, then, is not to cast that category into doubt or to derogate the significance of rational deliberation as a feature of our identity. It's rather to warn against identifying being a person in this sense with being a self like us, a member of the broader and messier category to which one refers when one talks about what falls within the range of the distinctively human. I announced at the beginning of my talk that this lecture would raise more questions than it would answer, and I hope that you think that I have made good on that claim, if nothing else. To the question, what is the distinctively human, I've certainly not given an answer, nor even ruled out the possibility that we should at some point stop asking that question and pursue self-understanding in other terms. Still, it's better to know what we don't know and to be aware of what we have falsely assumed than to carry on happy in the illusion that when we speak of responsibility, of personhood, and of what makes us distinctively human, we know what we are talking about. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I hope I'm one of those selves. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> okay, so questions? Yes, please. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I was actually not one of those. So. <laughs> Hello. Uh, this is the third day I'm here. Yeah. And I, I have an example for you now with uh, David Crockett. Yeah, good. A specific <laughs> example. <laughs> And uh, I want to delve a little bit deeper into what morality is. What is morality? And um, so suppose that um, David Crockett found himself in a situation. I, I can tell the people here that I took up uh, an example yesterday when he was in a battle with the uh, Indians and, uh, and the American army, together with the American army against the Indians in Kentucky. And he blamed himself for participating in that action since uh, there was a lot of w there were a lot of women and children killed and um it, whether if he if he found his, if he so so to speak could had two choices in this battle 
He could save the, the young boy, a 13-year-old young Indian boy who had a tomahawk, and he was about to bury it in a soldier that uh, had a rifle, a loaded rifle, and what, it was a suicidal act. He could have knocked uh, this kid to the ground and saved his life. Or he could have um, saved a, a, a fellow soldier's life. And he did the latter. And um, uh, well, you might consider that uh, saving the boy's life is more important because the boy is uh, emotionally upset. He didn't know what he was doing. He was 13 years old. And uh, I might argue that uh, saving the soldier's life would be more important since he was a brother in, arm, brother in arms. He cannot be blamed for any of these actions because um, he can be criticized, but he cannot be blamed. Because I don't think even God could uh, say that doing the one thing is better than the other thing. It's a gray zone of morality in this case. And uh, he, can, he can be criticized, but he cannot be blamed in any, in, any, in any choice. What do you think about that? Uh, well, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the idea that it's a gray zone. I, other people in the room might not be. Um, I kind of don't want to get into uh, these other huge issues of the um, determinacy of morality and our ability to discover it or understand it. But I, I'm sympathetic to your point of view on this. Um, you're, in a way, I think, trying to ask a question that I didn't answer well yesterday about a distinction I made in yesterday's lecture between blame and criticism. And just for the sake of the audience who's at this lecture, I don't, I don't want to really go into it now. I, I think if you can't, I mean, the, the example as I understand it is an example um, where the gray zone makes it unclear whether criticism is appropriate either. It's, I mean, you need to you need to be fully clear on what the evaluative, the, the correct evaluative response is to this, it, in order to decide whether blame is appropriate, whether criticism is appropriate, or neither. And as I say, that it opens up whole controversies. I'm not, I don't feel especially ready to get into. Um, to relate it to this lecture and what it is, I mean, I think it's the kinds of concerns that Davy Crockett might have in coping with his own activity and reflecting on it seem to me very, you know, a, a good example of selves like us. They're very human. They're not, they're not rational. I mean, that is, they're not purely, it's not purely about reason. It's about um, a connection to other uh, other human beings, to 13-year-old boys, to fellow soldiers in one's, uh, in one's group, one's army. Um, and, I, you know, and I think the fact that pure rational deliberation isn't going to settle all the things that we actually like Crockett for being concerned with is just, you know, another thing that should go on the list of the, you know, selves like us properties that go beyond the rational self-control properties that I've been trying to underemphasize. Okay, it doesn't really answer the question what morality is, but I, do, I didn't okay. expect you could answer it because n not even God can, perhaps, in this case. Thank you. Thank you. So let's see, we have, uh, there's only one mic. Oh, ah, no. perfect. Ule. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you, that was a fascinating talk. Uh, I have a question. So I was thinking when you listed these uh, capacities that were distinctively human, so mortality, sentience, intelligence, and so on, um, it struck me first that they seemed quite individualistic. So, but quite, I mean, it's a, I think quite a sort of popular thought now that 
what makes us distinctively human is our sociality and and abilities to cooperate and think of ourselves as group members and think in terms of in groups and out groups and so on. Um, and then on your la on this responsible agency slide where you distinguish persons from selves like us, you put negotiation and cooperation and so on on the person side. Right. So I was just wondering. Um, well, it's just like a comment and a question whether it's, I mean, is it fair to say that your view is kind of individualistic or do you think that there's something, um, that something like thinking in terms of group membership or something should be on the list of distinctively human as well? Uh, yeah, it, it's a good question. I, um, on the one hand, I want to say wherever you put cooperation and negotiation, those are individualistic terms also. <laughs> uh, you know, it's individuals who have to, I mean, right? That, so that's, that particular thing doesn't strike me as, uh, as more collective. Um, but but more, more importantly, uh, what you're pointing out is, it, it's true I, when, that I, in writing this draft of this paper, um, have been thinking about comparing individual human beings with individual uh, members of other species, of other, you know, AI, individuals and individuals, uh, and thinking particularly like what kind of individual can I relate to in a community that is something more than a group of negotiating, cooperating, uh, you know, cohabiting individuals. Uh, what can, you know, that can make a family, a, a village in the s sense in which that's used metaphorically, right? Um, but so to the general question, is your view individualistic? Well, I guess there are two things I want to say. One is, um, what I think is missing, and I just want to add it on, put, you know, put in some more, uh, the social, the fact that we are social animals, that um, not just, well, that we need not just other beings to cooperate with, but we need love, we need to, to love and be loved. I mean, well, I mean not need, we, you know, that this, uh, that is an extremely important part of being a self like us. Each individual having those capacities and drives to be in some kind of community with other individuals. It's not unique to us. There are social, some animals are social. And in fact, with the animals that can not only be social to each other, but to, to us, like dogs, uh, that, that's one of the things that makes them more like us than you know, some of the kind of scary extraterrestrials of science fiction. Uh, so I, I just, it's a failure of this version, but thank you for reminding me to, to add that on. Um, and then there's a, a bigger question, which I know some of you have, uh, have more thoughts about than I currently do about actually collective agency in a, in a you know, more like, yeah, I, can a collective be a self like us? At, at the moment, I think no, but I'm open to consider reconsideration. Well, first, thank you very much for three very interesting uh, lectures, and I have no criticism of any of the theses you have put forward, but I'm lacking one. You stressed moral concern, you stressed the emotions, but you haven't said one word about moral emotions. Now, there are, if we stick to negative moral emotions and self-appraising ones, take shame, guilt, remorse. Now, I think that they could, could or should be called, taking the term uh, from your first lecture about reactive attitudes that they should be called self-reactive attitudes. Right. And I think it belongs to selves like us to be able to have self-reactive attitudes. 
Now I may be wrong, but superficially I think I have noted that there are a number of philosophers who I hope and I think you should judge as having over-intellectualized human nature. Uh, they said, now people can really be punished by themselves by feeling ashamed. They can really be punishing themselves by feeling guilt and a bit softer, but even by remorse. So they want to take this kind of reactive attitude out of everyday world, just as you have said in philosophy, they would like to have the, take the reactive attitudes away altogether. So, put my question like this. Why didn't you bring up self-appraising moral emotions? And do you, I haven't thought in detail about it until listening to you, would you agree with my present view that such kind of self-reactive uh, attitudes, it, it belongs to selves like us. Yes, I would agree with all of that. I mean, I, I, right, so there's, uh, again, um, maybe I should, I should go out of my way to say something more explicitly about that. It, in, in Strawson's initial introduction of the term reactive attitudes and of sort of noticing these as um, as part of what it is to be human and as central to responsibility. He does, I mean, th though resentment and <coughs> gratitude and anger and indignation are the ones that get mainly talked about. He is explicit and uses the very same vocabulary of self-reactive attitudes to talk about pride and shame and guilt. Um, I don't know if remorse comes in, but um, and I just I agree with all of that. Uh, um, they are uh, right, uh, and in, in many contexts, uh, I think thinking morally is best done by thinking about what self-reactive attitudes are appropriate to um, to the agent's behavior. Um, so yeah, no, I just I think I agree with everything you said, and to the question of why didn't I mention them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. okay. Any more Thank you, Susan. But I wanted to ask you about how do you think of this concept, selves like, like us? Uh, so uh, I, I tend to think about it as a, as a uh, family concept, kind of, you know, on this Wittgenstein and lines. So if some, someone is a self like us, uh, and then we consider selves like this group of person. Well, it's this. It is not a necessarily a transitive uh, relation, yes. which would mean that uh, uh, the number of characteristics that you, you specified, well, uh, each of them is sort of relevant, but uh, uh, for for many of them, they are they don't seem to be necessary right. for, for someone to be a self like like us. So right. kind of. You know this. Uh, if one allows for this uh, uh, non-transitivities, right? Yes. So, so that was something that was uh, kind of missing there, there right? Is the that I didn't say. But that you you didn't kind of discuss the necessity of those uh, uh, features one by one. So right. It's a sort of. It seems that you need to have enough of those features that you have uh, identified to be a self uh, like us, right? But do you need to have all those features? Well, right. just, to, just to give you an example. Well, uh, emotions, right? It's kind of, it's a very important feature, right? But uh, you suggested that um, one couldn't have uh, values without emotions, right? And I'm not sure about that. Uh, so, of course, I, Did I one suggest couldn't have many, well, you said that if people, uh, uh, would just have desires, right? They couldn't have values, right? That the, there would be that there's a necessity. Well, you 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 need emotions. Uh, uh, maybe I misunderstood that, but I thought that well, you certainly wouldn't have many of the values that we have. So let's say <coughs> value like admirability. Well, we we need to to be able to admire someone, right? Yes, but uh, 
we certainly w w could have other values like desirabil <coughs> d desirability w without having emotion. So it's a sort of what was this? What was desirability. Desirability. Yes, yeah, something is desirable, of course, and we, we can have those values. Uh, and those are not the same things as. Des so we can value something in the sense that we desire it and we think of it as being fitting to desire, right? So, and this is not the same thing as just desiring that thing, right? Yes. So, so, uh, so I, I was kind of, you know, I, I thought that all those features you were very, very important, very relevant, but at the same time, perhaps none of those features or many of those features weren't necessary, though, right, for being a self. So to the to the main question, is is it a family resemblance concept or is it a concept that you want to come up with necessary and sufficient conditions? Uh, a fam it seems very likely to me that it's a family resemblance concept or that at least the things that I, if it's not a family resemblance concept, I mean, if there's some other analysis, it's not going to be coming from that list. It's not like I, I didn't want to suggest I, though you're right, I didn't say one way or the other what I was doing with this. I, um, you know that these are nece these are necessary conditions of being a self like us. Uh, they're not. I mean, at least m most of them are not. Uh, whether you want to say, could you have, could you be without any emotion and being a self like us? That I mean, the short answer is it depends on what you want to do with that. Cons you know, what is that question being called in the service of? Um, and in this talk, I'm just I'm asking sort of very uh, loosely defined questions, kind of speculating, um, where the main uh, the main impulse is to just sort of open up reflection on questions and concepts that I feel have been. Um, <laughs> Uh, using overly narrow paradigms uh, as, of examples in order to say what is it to value something, what is it to be capable of X or Y, what is it to be intelligent, and thinking, look, you're, you're looking at too small a range of things. There are all this other stuff, and they're all important, and they're all, and in, for some of us in some contexts, they're more important than the stuff you're folks. So it's really it's a very loose uh, um, use of the term, and I think for many contexts. Um, in which one might go on from here, um, there is really no reason to want to say, well, is it or is it not a self like us? Uh, you know, all you want to say is, at least in these respects, we've got a way to relate to each other and and go forward, and even if not in these others. So that's sort of the basic thing. Uh, maybe at another point, I I can ask you more about, or we could talk more about the more particular question about what is it to value something i didn't i don't think i meant to say you can't have values without emotions i i did th think if there if you had no emotions i maybe i was thinking of emotions and desires as too closer together than i ought to be thinking about them um i was you know i was thinking of kind of the um angels, rational agents who d have no desires or emotions, that there would be no split between what they judged was best and what they wanted to do. There would be the distinction between desires and values <coughs> would be uh, irrelevant to them because they didn't have anything to pull against their, I mean, their values would just be all there was, basically, or, you know, but... Um, but maybe I'm wrong about that too. Anyway, that's that's perhaps a different or peripheral question to the issue of necessary and sufficient conditions and so on. Okay. So, so uh, the, uh, listening to this gave, gave me a suggestion um, that I just want to get your response to. If we begin with people like uh, Singer and others who want to distinguish between the person and the human being and identify the properties of persons, and, and other philosophers too, we're often running with the, 
higher capacities, the rational, um, and the, a lot of the intellectual capacities. And you're try one thing I understand you to be doing is try to bring it down a little. It's not all intellectual that make us selves like us. It's it's other things. But one thing that didn't get emphasized is how much we might want to get back to the biological and to the physical and our relation to our physical natures. You did that somewhat when you talked about athletic achievement and, um, and a few other things. But the fact that we are embodied, that we grow, that we mature, that we age, that we're conscious of mortality and death seems to influence the <laughs> the ways we identify ourselves in, in ways. I just invite you to speculate more on that because relation to our physical natures didn't, didn't figure in very heavily in, in the talk. Right. Uh, good. Well, uh, at least one thing that I could do, as I had said, you know, I should put in more about our, soci our social natures and how that interacts with some of our other abilities in ways that seem at least in some important contexts, extremely uh, central to being a self like us. Uh, our emb embodiment and relation to our being embodied uh, might be another thing that I should just add and think more about. I, 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 don't, I haven't thought about it um, explicitly. As you say, athletics is one case, I think a lot of aesthetic sensibilities, I mean, they're sensibilities, most of them, that, you know, are definitely related to our sense organs, including, I mean, if you talk about taste, um, that's more, it somehow seems like a more bodily uh, sense organ than, than uh, vision, for reasons others have speculated on. Um, so that's another relevant feature, and, um, and our mortality, as, again, some philosophers, especially continental philosophers, have thought more about how significant that is to, to, uh, to what values we have and what we, you know, can relate to. But yeah, I just haven't thought about it enough. But it's a good idea. <laughs> so. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask you about the um, sort of the way in which we can find out. Um, what features are characteristic of cells like us. So I think if I understood your talk correctly, you were kind of gesturing to two methods of doing that. So one would be kind of comparison. So we have, say, human beings, and then we compare with animals or with machines or corporations or kind of imaginary creatures of various kinds. But I think sometimes you also mentioned kind of thinking of what would be required for mutual understanding. Um, and that could maybe also be a method for figuring out what is characteristic for selves like us. So in, in some cases, say when we interact with an animal, we have this feeling that we are understanding some of the emotions that are being expressed and so we can sort of ask well what what are the kinds of things that we can understand when we interact with other kinds of creatures and then we can also turn around and ask well what would it take for another kind of creature to be able to fully understand someone like us so so say maybe um a machine would be able to understand some features of us, say, what we're doing when we try to solve a math problem, but it wouldn't be able to kind of understand other features like emotions. And what would it take for a creature to be able to kind of fully understand someone like us? I don't know whether that's a method for kind of thinking about what's involved. Right. Um, well, I'm not very good at, n at knowing what counts as a method, or if, when yeah. people say, "What you know? What's your methodology?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I do uh, take this as a you know a happy suggestion that this is another. I mean, maybe the right way to think 
I, I don't know about right. Uh, one way to think of it is you come at it from every angle you can, mm -hmm. sometimes thinking about um, uh, qualities we have and then saying, oh, and this individual has it too, can be a reason for us to to be hopeful while well, we can we can relate to each other you know thanks to this common interest and you know and expand from there right mm -hmm. and i guess what you're suggesting is the other from the other direction we f you find ourselves you're relating in a certain way and then sort of abstract from that to say well what is it you know what's going on and what's missing from that and and go out the other way it seems like a good idea so yeah so i I'll ex uh, accept that uh, and hope that um, I haven't contradicted myself in any way. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay, any more questions? Eric? Um, I was wondering whether it's the um, um, capacity for this uh, Distinctively human qualities that matter. That the capacity for, for um, yeah, various emotions and uh, for um, yeah, doing arts and philosophy, or whether it's sort of the realized uh, abilities to actually do this. Uh, because I think that, that that would matter, at least to some ways of using a concept like uh, self like us, uh, because if it's I could imagine that if it's the capacity, then it would be, it would include, uh, I mean, so infants and children and, uh, oh. and so on, um, and maybe even certain artificial intelligences and so on. Um, but where is if it's the sort of the developed um, exercise of these capabilities, then maybe selves like us would be uh, coextensial with persons, basically. Oh. Um, well, it's a. G I'll leave that last for a minute because I I didn't think that develop that it was going to be coextensive with persons because th I think there might be developed persons who are not selves like us or at least it's in principle possible um, because they don't have even these capacities <laughs> to have a sense of humor or empathy or whatever. Um, but um, but it's a very good question. Like, what you know, is it the capacity or the uh, you know the successful realization of those capacities that makes a difference? Um, I don't actually want to answer that question by saying it's. Uh, I mean, if I had to answer it, I would say some. It's the capacity. If if you force me to you know choose, but really, and this was relevant to. The discussion yesterday about the capacity, sensitivity to reasons, the capacity to appreciate, um, you know, why you shouldn't, you know, what was sexist about your responses, or why, what was wrong with being sex. Um, I mean, there's there are different levels or degrees of capacity, closer and further from the actual realization, or you know, the exercise of them, um, and in different contexts, I think we'll want to refer to different things. Um, so certainly, when th uh, the remarks I made, for example, about artificial intelligences, um, I was thinking about current artificial intelligences, not what's, for the most part, and the limits of my imagination about what, you know, what was to come later. But as I as I mentioned, you know, what do I know about what's to come later? And um, so there's the capability of there being artificially created selves like us. Uh, yeah, but sure. <laughs> why not? I mean, well, I don't know why not. I, as I say, somebody. Um, and <coughs> right. So I, I think the the answer I should give is in some contexts you want to refer to just, you know, the capacity to develop into someone who has, who has a sense of humor and who has a sensitivity to beauty. And in other contexts, you want, or I think I was using it differently, where I said, look, we've got an infant. An infant isn't a self like us yet, right? 
So, right, it just varies. It's useful to notice that, though. Okay, we have Ludwig. Just about something that you said in, at the beginning of your uh, the lecture. So it's about taking pride in something. And you suggested that you could take pride in something without, uh, well, in some of our features, right, or uh, exploits or whatever, right, yeah. without thinking that we are better than others. And of course, uh, it, this sounds very plausible, right? Okay. But on the other hand, uh, um, one thinks, well, but isn't it the case that if we take pride in something, yeah, then we are. Th we think that in that respect we are better than others. And of course, since being better than others is a sort of all things considered thing, so maybe we are not at all better than others, all things considered. But in that respect, so there is this comparative element of uh, we, we <coughs> must think of this uh, as being objectively good, right? Of that we are pride in, uh, take pride in, and in that respect we are better than others, right? <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so. Uh, so they, the, yeah, okay, so that's... Uh, yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's any reason I have to reject that. I mean, I, um, sometimes I talk about things that we cherish in ourselves, which doesn't necessarily uh, mean the same. Uh, sometimes you can take pride in something because it's better than what you used to do or what you sometimes do. Like, I'm really proud of this, you know, paper or this, you know, this class because the last one I wrote was, or taught was so much worse. But um, where I don't actually need to compare myself to others, no, you know, it's just it's to a standard. Yeah. Okay, um, so, so I have a question. Um, so I'm a bit curious. No, it's not, not even a question, just to want to hear what you say. So uh, so on the one hand, you, you speak about self as being a sort of an ethical notion, no? and that later on you, 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 you sort of characterize the self in terms of, of this idea of an evaluative take. No? And, and I take it that an evaluative take can be not necessarily a, a, a moral or an ethical take, no. So I, I wonder. I mean, if you if you look at us as prehistorical beings, no, I, I suggest that that we have selves. I'm not sure. Would you say that they were having selves like us? Prehistorical beings like Neanderthals, you mean? Not necessarily Neanderthals. Let's go a bit further up. I mean. So I mean the early, I mean early early man. Oh, I don't know. I I don't so know. What do you think? <laughs> I don't think that, that they were necessarily having a kind of an ethical uh, self in the sense that I think you are having in mind, which suggests that that this notion of self that you are talking about is something that could very easily develop. No. Yeah. So any suggestions about our future selves? Ah, it, well. I think the first problem is is getting there, right? Like, can we survive long enough for there to be, uh, you know, a, a really interesting change? So, um, yeah, okay. I won't speculate. So we'll leave this speculation for later. Any more questions? Then I think that uh, before we uh, all self like us show Susan our appreciations, I would like to call our for our head of department, who would like to um, bring you something here. OK, you have a mic. So. Yep. Um, thank you for these uh, lectures. Um, and on behalf of the whole department of philosophy, including cognitive science, I would like to present you with the Puffendorf Medal. If I can open it on the right way, I couldn't. <laughs> Looks like chocolate, but it's uh, <laughs> but it's just a metal. An ex <laughs> exclusive uh, oh. bronze. Um, beautiful. Wow. So there you have that, and also a diploma. Thank you. Th Thank you. Uh,
glad I put in an Olympic athlete up there because now I can feel like I measure up. But um, yes, thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you for how how warmly um, and interestingly you've uh, you've received and and talked with me about these lectures. So great. Thank you very much.